Good afternoon, uh, everybody, and welcome to our session on uh, genomics. The session, the special special session, is part of the European Biotech Week and the Personalized Medicine Conference. The Personalized Medicine Conference is organized by the, the organization I led, the Center for Innovation in Medicine, in partnership with Europa Bio, with the Local American Working Group and the Foundation Medicine and Roche. Thank you all for uh, joining us today for a great, great session. In the current context of anniversary, we uh, uh, are 20 years after the publishing of the draft of the Human Genome Project. And I'm very happy to uh, say that we have uh, today a special guest, Professor L. Green, who is one of the pioneers in the field of Human, gen human Genome projects, uh, Project and uh, Genomics. Dr. Green was involved from day one, or even before, um, to the finish in the Human Genome Project, and is currently the director of the National Human Genome Research Institute at uh, the N National Institute of Health in the United States. Dr. Green will discuss today about the past, present, and future of genomics and the implication for human health. Feel free to, to use the chat or Q&A to ask any question, because we'll have a Q&A session after the lecture of uh, Professor Green. Dr. Dr. Green, thank you so much for being with, uh, with us today. It's a great honor to, to have you with us. And uh, now, actually, the Zoom is yours, not actually the floor. OK, well, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I'm delighted to be here and, and to be able to share with you through virtual means uh, an update about the past, the present, and, and the future of human genomics, a field of study I've been involved in really since, since the very beginning of genomics. I also think it's very timely uh, to do it this month, in particular for reasons that will unfold um, uh, throughout my talk. So what I'm gonna really try to go through today is um, really three things. I wanna talk about sort of the history of, this, of genomics, the sort of the first three decades of the field. I'm gonna describe for you sort of some of the current realities and but also opportunities in human genomics. And then in particular at the end, I'm very excited to tell you about a new strategic vision um, that my institute uh, will be publishing um, actually at the end of next month. So let me start with uh, really a, a quick review of the history of, of genomics. Uh, because I realize uh, I'm probably speaking to a, an audience with, with different backgrounds and familiarity with genomics. And I think there's a number of key points that are, are worth making. You know, it's sort of hard to say where was the beginning or where was the first seed planted. And there's probably a lot of historic places you could go back to say that was where the first seeds of genomics were planted. I actually think the, the discovery of the double helical structure of DNA uh, in the early 1950s was really a key moment in, in the earliest germination, if you will, of insights and ideas that eventually gave rise to the field of genomics. It was, it was really that, that key insight um, that matched structure to function that really illustrated how it was that DNA was the information molecule for all living systems. And really set up, therefore, a set of discoveries that took place in the subsequent decades um, that, that really uh, uh, ended the, the last century. I mean, for example, you know, the 1960s then arrived on the scene and, and in a matter of a, of a decade or so, uh, the unraveling of that famous genetic code that gave information about how it was that DNA encoded the information for making proteins, the building blocks of cells and tissues and, 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 and organisms. And of course, it was that triplets and, you know, and the whole understanding of that code that was critical for understanding that functional part of DNA. But so much more remained to be uh, discovered about how DNA worked and really what it was doing as an information molecule. And I think the 1980s were pivotal in terms of the development of new tools and technologies for manipulating DNA, for cloning DNA, um, and for being able to study it in the laboratory in a very robust fashion. And that included building on uh, the success, early successes of being able to read out the letters of DNA, the nucleotides, the Gs, As, Ts, and Cs, uh, that, of course, the sequence of which encodes all the biological information. But as the 1980s marched along, the technologies got better and better and better. 
And it soon became clear that, you know, the idea of being comprehensive and studying all the DNA of an organism didn't seem like such a science fiction idea. Uh, all the DNA of an organism, of course, is its genome. And the idea was, well, maybe we could refine our tools for mapping and then eventually sequencing DNA that we could one day read out all the nucleotides of an organism's genome. And by the late 1980s, that idea started to really converge on some pretty audacious uh, notions. And that is actually when the field of genomics uh, was, was born. Uh, in fact, if you go back in the scientific and medical literature, you will not find the word genomics in the literature prior to 1987. First time it was put in the literature was in this lead audit, uh, editorial in a brand new journal that had been established uh, called genomics, where they described this newly emerging discipline um, of analyzing, mapping, and sequencing, and really characterizing genomes. And that was the first use of the word genomics, and that was when basically the field began a little over three decades ago. By the way, 1987 is a very important year in my life. It was actually the year I graduated with my MD and my PhD, which is actually interesting because it means I never once heard the word genomics in medical school or graduate school because the word didn't exist. And so I came on the scene as a, prof a young professional at the same time that this new field was just coming on the scene. Now, why was it in the late 1980s that a new field was named and there was all this excitement about technologies and approaches for mapping and sequencing genomes. And it really related to this idea that internationally groups of scientists had started to come together and thought about the idea of being truly audacious and trying to tackle the complete characterization of the human genome, to read out all of the roughly 3 billion letters, the Gs, As, Ts, and Cs that make up the human genome. This gained a lot of traction internationally. And so by 1990, the Human Genome Project was launched. Um, I was very fortunate. I was in the right place at the right time. I was able to participate in the Human Genome Project, actually as a clinical trainee and a postdoctoral fellow, and participate in the project from beginning to end. The project was unusual in scope and scale. It was big science. It was collaborative. It was highly consortium-oriented. It was in, you know, involved many funders and multiple countries. Uh, it was also remarkable because it was successful. In fact, it was more successful than originally envisioned. We thought it would take 15 years to complete. Uh, and all the goals of the Human Genome Project were completed um, in 13 years. Pause and point out, I, if I'm talking about the Human Genome Project, this is a great week to be talking about it because Thursday of this week is October 1st and October 1st of 2020 will actually be a very important moment. It will be precisely the 30th anniversary of the launch of the Human Genome Project. So from a historical perspective, we think back and I can think back recognizing that, that you know, we, the gun went off and the, 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 the race began to map and sequence the human genome 30 years ago. Um, and we could look back and just be really quite pleased with all of the progress uh, that has uh, transpired since. In fact, I think it's important to, to sort of list these things for you. Um, and I'll have to do this rapidly, but if we really look back on the first three decades, it's, you know, it's maybe 33 years or something that genomics has been around, but especially with the idea that we're celebrating the 30th anniversary of the Human Genome Project's launch, it really is worth listing what have some, been some of the highlights in the history of this young field of genomics. First and foremost, you know, the highlight is the successful sequencing of the human genome for the very first time by the Human Genome Project. And I can tell you that when the Genome Project ended, there was, which really it ended about 17 years ago, there was you know, great euphoria that we had read out a human genome sequence. We had in front of us 3 billion ordered letters of the human genome. But I will also point out that there was the recognition that that was just the start. And then of course we needed to do this many, many times and eventually do this on individuals on a routine basis. But it was a fairly expensive endeavor. And it was immediately recognized that what had to follow the Human Genome Project more than any other thing was new technological innovations that would reduce the cost of sequencing DNA of sequencing genomes. And in fact, I think we can look very proudly in the rear view mirror, now recognizing that those technological innovations came to fruition. And in fact, um, what we were able to see is with those technological innovations, just truly spectacular widening of the use of genomics across many different areas. In fact, all of the areas listed here um, were, were clearly 
have been extensively impacted by the use of genomics and, and the infusion of genomics. And I'm not going to talk about any of these, but I'm just going to acknowledge that genomics has now sort of gone wide and far because of the technological innovations that follow the Human Genome Project. What I'm going to focus my talk on is, is understanding how genomics has been applied in health and looking at human disease and in the practice of medicine. And I will tell you that um, the notion of applying genomics to medicine once the Human Genome Project ended was sort of obvious. And in fact, if you go back and look, you know, whether you go to the popular press, like the cover of this uh, magazine, the New York Times Magazine, or you look in the scientific press, like the cover of Science, shortly after the Genome Project, it was very obvious to put those two words together. Because one of the rationales for the Human Genome Project from the beginning was to be able to get better insights about the human blueprint, the human genome, and being able to use that information about individual patients' blueprints, individual patients' genomes, to tailor their medical care. And that is how genomic medicine basically came um, into the, the forefront immediately following the Human Genome Project. However, I will tell you, I was there 17 years ago when everybody started talking about genomic medicine, and it was pretty blurry what that concept actually meant, what it was going to look like, how we were going to operationalize it, how we were going to get there. But it was clear this was the future for human genomics. And so by just to be clear, by genomic medicine, what I mean is this evolving medical discipline that aims to use information about patients' genomes as part of their medical care, not just treating patients based on the average presentation of patient, average treatment, the average management, but recognizing that every patient has a slightly different genome. And if we could harness information about those differences, we could tailor their medical care. So it's using genomic information on individual patients to tailor their medical care. Now, how, we, how are we gonna realize genomic medicine? Well, it, it, this was gonna be a journey, very much like the journey of the Human Genome Project. It was gonna be a journey that began with the completion of the Human Genome Project. That was really the starting line for this next journey of genomics. And it was gonna end when we actually could operationalize genomics in medical care around the world in a highly robust fashion. Now we could start to imagine 17 years ago what some of those steps were gonna be, but we didn't know what all of those steps were gonna be. And we also recognized that Unlike the Human Genome Project, which sort of had a, had, a, had a clear finish line when you have the sequence of the human genome, this was going to be much longer term. It was going to be much, uh, much more complicated, um, and the endpoint was not going to be as crystal clear. We also could appreciate when the Genome Project ended that genomic medicine was not going to be realized by one laboratory, one scientist, one funder, one country, uh, This was, nor one discipline. It was gonna, like the Human Genome Project, require many people, many disciplines, many countries, many scientists. And, and certainly um, it was not gonna be a sprint, but rather it was gonna be much more analogous to a marathon. One where many people from across the world with different disciplines will be running shoulder to shoulder, probably for many years to fully navigate the journey from the Human Genome Project to the realization of genomic medicine. So that then brings me back to this notion of technological innovation. If that, that vision was going to be realized, and we were going to actually be sequencing patients' genomes as part of their routine medical care, we were going to have to have a very different approach than what was used for sequencing that first human genome as part of the Human Genome Project. The good news is that we have done this. We have had that technological innovation the last 17 years. And in fact, to put a fine point on it, we have reduced the cost of sequencing a human genome by more than a million fold since the end of the Human Genome Project. And to just remind you what some of these numbers look like, you know, keep in mind when the Human Genome Project ended 17 years ago, we generated that first sequence of a human genome, but it cost about a billion US dollars. It was you know, expensive, worthwhile, but a lot of money far too expensive for a clinical test. What we needed was to knock six zeros off of that figure and deliver what was affectionately referred to as the $1,000 genome. And this has been this remarkable technical innovation that I don't really have time to describe in detail. You could read about it. It's been many, many publications about this. But the bottom line is in 17 years, we have seen this massive reduction in the cost of sequencing human genomes and now can routinely do it for less than $1,000. That created all sorts of opportunities. Um, it created the ability not just to settle on one human genome sequence, but recognize that we were interested in how we differ. Each of us has 
about one in a thousand letter differences in our genome compared to any other person's genome. So we're 99.9% .9 identical at the sequence level, but it means one out of a thousand letters are different. And if you go across the whole genome, that's about three to five million differences uh, that each of us carries compared to any other person. We wanted to catalog those, those differences, have them available for scientists to be able to study. And we have progressed now from having one genome sequence to literally having hundreds and hundreds of thousands of human genome sequences, increasingly having that data be available to scientists and clinicians worldwide, cataloging the differences and increasingly characterizing those differences. We've built on that knowledge of human genomic variation to start to understand, although we have a long way to go, how is it that genomic variation influences genome function and therefore biology. And, but to do that, we need to understand how the human genome works. And here we've made profound advances in understanding how the human genome functions, although we're probably only a fraction of the way in fully interpreting the human genome sequence. But you know, we have a pretty good handle on the human genes. It's about 20,000 genes in the genome. We have a pretty good understanding of what those are. What we don't know as well is all the complex choreography of those genes in terms of all the sequences that regulate where, when, and how much they get turned on, as well as a number of other complex aspects of genome function, such as epigenomics and so forth. So this I often refer to as the multi-generational challenge. It's gonna require not just our generation or our trainees, it's gonna be sort of our grandchildren, you know, two generations from now, and they'll still be interpreting the human genome sequence. But I think we've made a lot of progress in 17 years. I think the next decade will be a very exciting one, but it will be a very, very important challenge to constantly understand all of the complexities of these 3 billion letters. But we've made enough progress in sequencing genomes, finding the variants, characterizing those variants to begin to understand how genomic differences amongst us influences our health and disease. And we've begun to be able to unravel the genomic basis of human disease. Most of the progress to date has been with rare genetic diseases, diseases like sickle cell anemia and cystic fibrosis that are caused by mutations in one gene. And we've made great progress. You know, when you go back to 30 years ago, the day the Genome Project ended, there were only 60 rare diseases that we knew what the gene which was mutated in that disease, just 60. Today, it's nearly 5,000 and growing every single week. So we've massively increased our understanding of rare diseases caused by mutations in single genes. The complexity though lies not in rare diseases, but in common diseases. Diseases like hypertension and diabetes and Alzheimer's and autism and, and mental illness and so on and so forth. And there, it's not just one gene, it's multiple genes. It's not always in the coding regions of genes. And it's, it's often highly influenced, um, heavily influenced by the environment and social determinants. And so these more important common diseases, important in terms of how much they affect health burdens worldwide, much more complicated. And we're beginning to have approaches to be able to tease that out, but it remains one of the great, cha the great challenges uh, uh, for the genetics and genomics community going forward. But still, I think we believe we'll make a lot of progress in the coming decade. The last highlight is actually a very gratifying one for me to put up, not because we are well down the road of having a complete understanding of how genomic medicine will be implemented, but rather that we have some vivid examples of genomic medicine, enough to sort of clearly illustrate that this is for real and that genomic medicine will find its way into routine medical practice. And so here, these examples have only come on the scene over the last really six, seven, eight, nine years but I did think it was valuable to point out how we've progressed in 17 years from a blurry idea of what genomic medicine is gonna look like to actually at least seeing these early examples come into very sharp focus. What are some of those examples? And let me just be brief. Um, I would say there are sort of four really clear highlights of sort of the tip of the iceberg of genomics finding its way into medicine. The first, is not something that I've mentioned, but I will absolutely mention now is cancer. It's, it's among the diseases for which we've learned a lot about the genomic basis. Cancer is a disease of the genome. It is changes in, in the genome of cells that result in them growing out of control and forming tumors. And we were able to sequence the genomes of, of tumor specimens. And as has gone on around the world, 
over the last 10 years have learned a tremendous amount about the genomic basis for cancer to the point that for some cancers, genomics is now part of the diagnostic workup and very much influences choices of treatment and management plans. Another area where genomics is finding um, absolute application is in the selection of medications and pharmacology. Pharmacology and genomics come together to create a field called pharmacogenomics, where it's not that medicines are designed for each patient, but rather for a given patient, you get genomic information that allows you to select among a list of possible medications, which is the best one suited for that individual. Because all of us carry in our genomes variants in drug metabolism pathways, um, or genes that are part of drug metabolism pathways that influence how we respond to medications. In some cases, making it so that we respond poorly to medications. But there's, a, there's other options in many cases for diseases like asthma and hypertension and so, and, and so forth. And the idea is if we could understand which genomic variants provide a signature to indicate which medicine to select off that list, we could avoid those adverse consequences of medications and better match people to, 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 to particular drugs. For now, for some um, medications and some disorders, I think that list will grow in the, in the coming years as we learn more. Another area that's absolutely here and now is the use of genome sequencing for very rare, in some cases, undiagnosed conditions. You know, once upon a time, we couldn't really imagine having a patient in front of us for which we didn't know what was wrong with them, but just sequence their genome and figure out what's wrong with them. Well, now that happens every month. In fact, around the world, hundreds and hundreds of patients with rare diseases get their genome sequenced every month. And we're getting better and better and better at figuring out what is wrong with those patients. In many settings, you could do it over 50% of the time that will yield a diagnosis. In some settings, we could even do this very rapidly, such as is being taken up in many neonatal intensive care units around the world, where you have a patient who is clearly not doing well as a neonate in an intensive care unit, and by sequencing their genome literally in 24 hours, in some cases, you can figure out what is wrong, in some cases, intervene and save that child's life. So we are seeing widespread adoption of genome sequencing as part of the diagnosis of a rare genetic diseases. And then in the prenatal period, prenatal testing has been gone on, has gone on for many decades in various settings uh, to provide expected parents uh, information about chromosomal abnormalities and so forth. Now these methods no longer require invasive uh, access to the DNA through procedures like amniocentesis, but rather through a simple blood draw of a pregnant mom, there, you can detect the small amounts of DNA that naturally float around in her bloodstream that are shed from the placenta that give information about um, um, chromosome copy numbers and so forth of the unborn child. In fact, this prenatal, non-invasive prenatal genetic testing is the number one genomic test in the world. Millions and millions of pregnant women will get that test done this year. It is probably the number one application of genomics in medicine at the present time. So that's my romp very quickly. Um, you can tell uh, through basically the first three decades of genomics. But I, I wanna pivot now and, and bring you to the present time and give you about four examples um, which I think very much balance this incredible enthusiasm I have uh, portrayed about genomics over the first three decades. I wanna balance that with some realities because not everything is perfect and not everything is carefree. Um, and we are facing some important realities um, although each of them bring uh, uh, research opportunities as well. Um, but it, it, this is where we are right now. Reality number one is that we can actually generate a human genome sequence pretty easily. I told you we can even do it in 24 hours. And in some cases we can use it to diagnose a disease in a patient with a rare disease. But I don't want to mislead you to think that when we generate a sequence from a patient and we go and we analyze it, we could actually pretty reliably analyze it to find the three to five million spelling differences in that patient's genome. And then we go to round on that patient. This is actually what we feel like most of the time. We really don't understand what most of those variants mean. Uh, we understand what some of them mean, but the great majority of them, we still don't know if they're clinically relevant or not. And so actually, uh, clinically understanding a patient's genome is just not trivial. And we have a lot more to learn, and there's a lot of efforts worldwide going on to make this very routine. And so, yes, we can do this, and it goes on all the time. It is just not routine enough, and we need to improve that. We need to make this very convenient as part of the clinical workflow if we're going to see genomic medicine uh, maximize its full potential. 
Another reality um, that I have witnessed in my three decades of being involved in genomics is it's really changed a lot in relevance. You know, when I got involved in genomics and the Genome Project started three decades ago, it was just a biomedical research endeavor. Just people working in the lab, at the bench, in front of a computer. When the Genome Project ended 17 years ago, we broadened our tent because we saw the clinical research opportunities and we saw the future of genomic medicine. And so healthcare professionals began to join us, but it was still just us as professionals. But once genomic medicine began to be realized, whether it be for cancer, pharmacogenomics, patients with rare diseases, or expected parents who um, were testing their unborn child, all of a sudden genomics is now becoming relevant for patients and their families and their friends. And that brings with it some pretty substantial responsibilities because it's no longer just a professional pursuit. It is now very much becoming part of society. And with that comes responsibilities related to literacy and understanding about what genomics is all about. There's issues around discrimination we have to be concerned about. There's issues around patents and intellectual property. And as genomics has touched medicine, it's gotten very complicated. Um, I could only, uh, I'm most familiar with the healthcare system in the United States, but what I do know is that healthcare systems in every country are complicated and have their own unique problems. And anytime you touch that ecosystem of healthcare, it gets incredibly complicated, no matter what country you're in. And so all of a sudden, genomics has gone from a scientific discipline to a societal um, uh, ecosystem that includes healthcare. And with that comes responsibilities to deal with many things around equity, literacy, payment, so on, and regulation, and so on and so forth. And so that's another reality we are dealing with as this field has matured. A third reality about genomics um, that I want to share with you is I don't want to lead you to believe that I think genomics is everything about health and disease. Um, I, I happen to have the, the, the benefit of studying sort of the left side of this pie chart and looking at how genomic variants influence health and disease because I've had technologies come on the scene in the last 10 years that have been incredible in terms of being able to analyze genomes. But I fully acknowledge that for the great, 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 great majority of diseases and of things that influence our health, it's a combination of our genes and our genomic variants and things like our lifestyle and environmental influences and what we're exposed to. But we haven't had quite the technologies to match our understanding of the genomics, but that's changing because we're getting better and better health and environmental monitoring technologies you know, as we've seen smartphones arrive in various types of sensors and mobile health devices. And in fact, you could read about this, of course, scientific literature is covering more and more how these various sensors for monitoring body analytes and physiology and various things, all that communicate with our smartphone really become data generators. In a similar way, we're seeing a revolution in our ability to measure these other contributions to health and disease as the last decade brought us a revolution in technologies for analyzing the genomic contributions to our health and disease. So this has led to this notion of precision medicine as opposed to genomic medicine. They're actually related. Precision medicine is just what I like to think of as a more precise accounting of individual variability. When I talked about genomic medicine, it was just about individual variability about genomics. But wow, if we have better technologies to be able to measure variability about our physiology, for example, or about you know, what we do to our, our lifestyle in terms of our exercise patterns and how we sleep, or maybe things we're exposed to in the environment, or things that we eat, or things that we do that are a little bit more destructive to our body. If we could get that data and marry it with the genomic data, we might be able to do a more comprehensive accounting of all the factors that play into our health and disease and be much more precise and how we monitor for disease, how we manage disease, how we treat disease and so forth. This has given a lot of excitement to this notion of precision medicine. And it's also gotten particularly exciting because of the convergence of these technologies. It's the technologies for genomics, it's these technologies for these new sensors and things we can do with smartphones and, and wearables, but also more and more around the world, we are capturing an immense amount of clinical data and electronic health records. And while that data is generally captured as part of medical care, it can also be used for research. And the idea is if you married all the data between genomics and these new technologies for monitoring our health and our lifestyle and so forth and electronic health record data, 
you would have a big data problem, but you'd have a very exciting big data problem that you could mine for teasing out nuances associated with health and disease. Countries around the world are starting major research programs that take advantage of this. In the United States, the program we have going on now is called the All of Us Research Program. It is very much modeled after other programs. For example, in the UK, they have something called the UK Biobank. And the idea is in the United States to get a, thousand, a million people to volunteer to, to join this program. These people will participate and they will share their genomic data. They'll share, they'll, they'll have wearables. They'll share lots of other information about themselves and they will provide access to their electronic health records. All this data will be captured, put into secure databases, but then freely shared with qualified researchers around the world um, as the UK Biobank data is being shared as well. And the idea, of course, is to have this available for scientists to be able to mine, scientists at all levels, maybe even including college and high school kids who can mine data and citizen scientists to tease out correlations that maybe can be discovered with the kind of scale of data that is being generated. I should really stress the US and the UK are not alone in this. There's actually now an international organization called the International 100K Cohorts Consortium uh, that consists of um, scientists around the world who are developing these population cohorts of at least 100,000 individuals. There's already well over 60 such studies, well over 30 million participants in these cohorts. And the idea is how can we share these data and be able to synergize across these studies and really make precision medicine a reality. And so there are, while, while genomics is not everything for health and disease, there are some very exciting opportunities in, in genomics um, as is applied more broadly to other aspects of individual variability and leading to this notion of precision medicine. And the last reality and opportunity, and it's really appropriate because I know I'm speaking to an international audience, is the reality that genomics and precision medicine absolutely require global collaborations. That's rooted in the culture of genomics dating back to the Human Genome Project, and it's now the case more than ever. And I think you've seen over the three decades of genomics, many historic examples of very productive global collaborations, whether it be the Human Genome Project, the International HapMap Project, the Thousand Genomes Project, most recently the International Cancer Genome Consortium. But these are not the only major projects that are going on or that have gone on. We have a plethora of them coming up uh, more recently, current examples, and I'll just sort of lay them out here, related, I mentioned one of them, um, the IHCC, but there's other ones related to rare diseases, to common diseases, to how we share data and harmonize it across uh, different studies, um, to how we actually share practices of genomic medicine implementation, and how we are also trying to tackle the challenges of making sure the data resources that are being developed are freely accessible to everybody around the world and that they are sustained in the long run because the access to those data resources is vital uh, to the scientific enterprise. So those are the four realities I wanted to share with you uh, that take us to the present time. But just in the last few minutes, what I wanna do is now take you into the future. And, in a, and I really am excited to tell you about a brand new strategic vision um, that, that we will be publishing in just a little under one month from now. And to really appreciate the context for this, I uh, do appreciate um, uh, that you can even hear from my early history of the field of genomics, that genomics very much started out with a very narrow focus, such as shown on the left side of this graphic, just focused on the Human Genome Project. But when the Genome Project ended 17 years ago, of course, it broadened and various other things branched out from it, cancer genomics and microbiome research and many other areas like the slide I showed earlier, where genomics just found its way into so many other things. Pivotal to the success of genomics, dating back to the Human Genome Project, has also been um, a, a history of developing strategic visions. Three of them were developed and published by the international group of funders um, that uh, led and funded the Human Genome Project. And every one of those, those uh, documents came about because of extensive engagement with the scientific community to come up with the most compelling ways to pursue the goals of the Human Genome Project. Our, my institute, the National Human Genome Research Institute at the U.S. National Institutes of Health, you know, took, the, took that idea forward when the Genome Project ended. So that literally the day the Human Genome Project ended, we had wrapped up an engagement process that had taken place over the last uh, two years of the Human Genome Project. So that in 2003, we published our institute's strategic vision for what's next in human genomics. 
And then we renewed that vision in 2011, in fact, started talking about the realization of genomic medicine in that second strategic vision. That these two NHGRI strategic visions in 2003 and 2011 really served us well. And together, these strategic visions also have really um, benefited us in, in tailoring and identifying what we are attempting to do as a funding group um, at NIH. I can tell you that NHGRI, my institute's the largest funder of genomics research in terms of being the, our sole goal actually in the world. And, and these strategic visions define different eras for us. You know, those three early strategic visions defined the era of the Human Genome Project. Uh, the 2003 strategic vision really defined the era we were building up from the foundation, the bedrock created by the Human Genome Project. And then the most recent strategic vision really brought us into this era of genomic medicine. What will our fourth era be like, having seen these first three? Well, we recognize that we wanted to start this new decade, the decade of the, you know, 2020 and beyond with a new strategic vision. We recognize the one we published in 2011 needed updating. And so we've uh, recently wrapped up um, a, a process of strategic planning, deep engagement with the scientific community aiming to establish a 2020 vision, if you will, for human genomics. And uh, we did this uh, in a similar, but in some ways different ways than we had done previously, because the world has changed in many ways since the last time we did strategic planning. What do I mean by that? Well, there really are two realities. You know, one reality is that, and it relates to an, an earlier slide where I talked about how genomics used to be very circumscribed, just involving a very small group of biomedical researchers pursuing the goals of the Human Genome Project. But genomics is, as a field has just changed substantially over these three decades, you know, dating back to the double helical structure of DNA. You know, the Genome Project illuminated the sequence and began to illuminate the functional annotations of the human genome. But once those new technologies became available, uh, the threads of the genome, if you will, increasingly found their way into basic science research and model organism research and, 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 and bench science in, in many, many different areas of biomedicine. And then as, as time marched on, increasingly it was being used in human genetic studies and, and, and data science and bioinformatics became a prominent aspect of genomics as the, the threads of DNA got woven into to those areas. And then most recently they found their way into medical care as genomic medicine became a reality. And it's involved not just one discipline, many disciplines and a lot of weaving of these threads of DNA deep into the fabric of biomedical research. And that's exactly where we are now and we will continue to be going forward as we see genomic medicine increasingly become more and more of a reality. Genomics once upon a time was very limited, but it is now deeply embedded within research, within medicine and increasingly within science, within society. Now the other reality we faced at NHGRI is the fact that as a funder, our role in this ecosystem completely has changed. You know, once upon a time, we were essentially the only institute of the 27 institutes and centers at NIH that funded genomics research. Now every center public, funds at some level genomics uh, research. Human genomics is everywhere. And as a funder, we can't say that we can strategically plan for all of genomics, nor can we fund for all of genomics. Genomics is bigger than us and it's more diffuse than, than a very limited scientific discipline. As a result, our role in the genomics ecosystem is not about being all of genomics, but rather as we adopted a new mantra recently, we're about the forefront of genomics. We are about funding the cutting edge, strategically planning about the cutting edge. And so dating back um, to, to uh, February of 2018, we kicked off a new round of strategic planning, this process that would give us a new strategic plan. Um, and we did so aligning it with this idea of not doing strategic planning across all of genomics, but doing it at the forefront of genomics. I can tell you that that uh, strategic vision is now a paper that's in press at a very prominent uh, scientific journal. Um, you may guess which one it is, but I'm not supposed to tell you necessarily until it comes out, it's under embargo. It will be published on October 28th. Um, and it was deliberately uh, chosen to publish this in the month of October because we wanted to commemorate the 30th anniversary of the launch of the Human Genome Project. So very much like a movie trailer, let me just spend a few minutes telling you briefly about the new strategic vision that NHGRI will publish next month. I hope all of you will read. But let me first show it to you. 
I can show you that if you take the 7,500 or so main words out of the new strategic vision, this is what it looks like. As expected, you see words like genomics and genetics and data and human and research. But you also see other really important words like you know, clinical, and you see things like disease and medicine as you expect. You also see things like workforce and equity and, and society and, and engagement and so forth. This is a very, very broad and, and complete document that touches many of the issues I've described to you in this talk with many of the, the realities and opportunities that the field now faces. What we were able to do is to take the input of literally thousands, I think, of scientists who contributed over the two plus years of our strategic planning. We had 50 events, workshops, sessions, town halls, all sorts, lots of opportunity to comment on our website. We took all that input and we put it into those 7,500 words that you saw in the word cloud, and then we organized those words into components. And ultimately, we found that when we looked at the fundamental components of the strategic vision at the forefront of genomics, they sort of fell into four major categories. And that's how the vision is organized. We recognize that to be at the forefront of genomics, especially now, and especially related to human genomics, we must think about the guiding principles and values that undergird the field. And so we articulate these underlying principles and values that are critical to the field of human genomics. And, and they range everything from data sharing to dealing with issues around diversity and health disparities and many societal um, implications of genomic advances. So one section of the paper deals with, with reaffirming and extending guiding principles and values that are undergird human genomics. We also recognize that being at the forefront of genomics is about taking responsible stewardship of what is happening in genomics for everybody who are using the tools and approaches of genomics. And that maintaining a robust foundation for genomics is absolutely critical. That foundation includes technologies, that foundation includes interpretations of the genome sequence, it includes developing new data science approaches, it includes a number of elements preparing society for genomics. And all these things are very foundational that everyone will take advantage of. But at the forefront of genomics, we will take responsibility to make sure that foundation is robust and that that foundation is sustained. We also found that some of the elements called for new high risk ideas that maybe if they come to fruition would knock down barriers that would benefit everybody doing genomics. And so we talked about breaking down barriers, sort of in the spirit of that thousand dollar genome I told you about earlier. We broke down that barrier of genome sequencing being too expensive. What's the next barrier and the other barrier beyond that and so forth as we look in basic genomics and translational genomics and clinical genomics and genomic medicine implementation? What are the great barriers that need to be knocked down that if we knock them down at the forefront of genomics, everybody would benefit because they were there, the impediments would be gone. We describe some of those in the new strategic vision. And then lastly, we also heard about some really important, audacious, compelling research projects in genomics. We thought those were very important to describe as well. And so we give a, a flavor of the kind of big research projects that we think are answering big questions, tackling big challenges. At the end of the day, even at the forefront of genomics, you have to do some very important uh, research projects that will prove to be beneficial to the entire field. So you will read about how these four areas contain elements that really represent the most important things to be considering at the forefront of genomics. And then we end the paper um, in a very fanciful and a lively way uh, by describing actually 10 bold predictions in human genomics by 2030. I'm not gonna tell you what they are. I will tell you, I don't believe all 10 will come true. We really wanted to go out on a limb. So we really put on our imagination hat, if you will, and came up with 10 different predictions that even if one or two or three of them came true, uh, we would say it was a successful decade. But I think you'll enjoy reading those because it gives you the kinds of ideas of what needs to be addressed. And even if we don't quite make the prediction, making progress toward it would really represent a very positive thing for the coming decade. So the paper will be released online on October 28th. It'll be published uh, in, in this particular issue that'll have a date of October 29th. I strongly encourage you to read it. If you want to come and read more about it, we are building a website, the URL is shown here, um, that will feature not only the paper, but feature lots of other things associated with the paper, and will build out over time all the things we are doing and increasingly others are doing uh, to, to, to address the things being described in the new strategic vision. 
So that's what I wanted to share with you. I hope you gain an appreciation of this remarkable three decades of genomics and what it's accomplished. I hope you can see the, the, the realities and challenges that we face now. And I hope I've given you a glimpse into the future through the eyes of our new strategic vision uh, that you'll be able to read about in full um, in less than a month. If you found any of this fun and interesting and you want to learn more or keep in touch, we do provide the means to keep in touch with the Institute and with me. I uh, publish a monthly newsletter uh, that comes out by email, um, which uh, I am delighted to share with anybody who wants an extra email every month. My staff and I work to put together updates and a lot of the things I talked about uh, that are most topical for that particular month. So if you want to sign up for our monthly newsletter, please feel free to, to go to this site and sign up. We'd be delighted to send you that email once a month. Similarly, I now have a, a participant, a full-fledged participant in Twitter, and we're doing a lot of stuff this week to commemorate the 30th anniversary. If you wanna follow me and you sort of enjoy Twitter, that's another way that we communicate things out both for me as the director, but also for the entire Institute. So please follow me if you're interested, we'd love to stay in touch. And so with that, I, I will stop. And I'm happy to answer your questions and have any sort of discussion that we want to have now. And any of the things I talked about are things that are on your mind. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for Professor Eric Green for your excellent uh, journey actually into the past and present and, and the future. And we are all waiting for October 28 to, to see the paper and uh, actually the 10 prediction for, pre predictions for the future in regards to, to genomics. Um, now it's time for um, the Q and A. I invite you all to to use the chat or Q and A uh, uh, on uh, on Zoom to to address questions to to Dr. Green. But I will start uh, uh, listening your 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 lecture. Uh, but I will start a little bit different. Usually when I uh, speak in uh, in Romania about genomics or personalized medicine or precision. And thank you so much for for defining and uh, for for explaining what are the differences between the uh, genomic medicine and precision medicine and personalized healthcare. But uh, every time when I discuss about this, uh, most of the people are saying, "Oh, this is something for for the future." But uh, you show us that actually genomics has a past, has a present. Uh, but this is something from coming from, uh, let's say, from uh, tradition, for, for, from the way uh, usually the health system, and you, uh, you said that there is a big challenge because the health system are, are complicated. And my question is how to, actually, where should we start from implementing genomics in, uh, in a country like, uh, like Romania? So that, that's probably very hard for me to answer. I've traveled to many countries. I've never traveled to Romania. And even if I had, I probably wouldn't necessarily be familiar enough with your healthcare system. I, will, I can tell you that what we have learned over the last uh, 10 years in particular, and, and I would strongly urge you, by the way, one of the, there's one thing I would urge you to think about is to get involved in one of the international consortium I, I mentioned, the G2MC. The genomic medicine, uh, you know, internet, the, the, co, co, the, the genomic medicine consortium, um, because of the global genomic medicine consortium. The reason I say that is because through that consortium, we've learned that that was where people from different countries, different health systems, came together to share best practices and be able to compare notes about the hurdles that they are facing implementing genomic medicine that are oftentimes related to the unique nuances of how their medical uh, care is paid for, how it's regulated, how the education system works and so on and so forth. So uh, it, it's hard for me to give advice uh, without knowing a lot of details. And even then, you know, I know a lot of details about the US and we are struggling mightily to figure out how to implement genomic medicine widely in the US. But what I would say is, is you wanna be part of an organization that is bringing best practices um, from all across the world, because there's so many nuances in the education. You know, because I mean, one of your questions, well, where do you start? You know, in, among the discussions, do you, do you start with the more senior clinicians that can be influential, or do you start with the medical students and just say we're going to make sure they realize what's possible, so that then when they grow up in the medical system, they're the ones that are going to be change agents. You know, or do you start with the payers? Do you demonstrate that? You know, you will save money in the long run, and therefore maybe you can try to convince them that this is going to be cost effective. It, it really just depends on so many factors. 
And I don't think it, there's not gonna be one size fits all for an implementation. But, but what I would say is um, it, it's very, what we're finding certainly in the US is it's very important to bring evidence. You can't bring PowerPoint slides. You have to bring evidence. You have to prove that this truly, in, that it improves the effectiveness of the delivery of healthcare. And, that, and it has to be done within the context of the how medical care is delivered locally. And so I do think you need research studies that are gonna demonstrate that not in another place, in another system, but in your place, in your system. And so whatever could be done to try to develop such studies, you know, I think could be highly influential for seeing local implementation. We have a question from Jorge Ruiz Beneke, who is actually the president of the Local American Working Group. Thank you so much, Jorge, for, for being with us. The question is, would you recommend Romania to start considering to build a biobank, collecting population biosamples and consents to enable precision medicine in, in the future? So I, I, I'm gonna sound, uh, you, you know, again, and it's exactly the reason why I was also involved in creating that consortium. This International 100K um, Cohort Consortium was specifically brought together to help, again, share best practices across different countries so that those either of those countries who have already started building such cohort studies would be able to, to share with others to be able to have more collaborations and learn best practices. But it was also designed to sort of develop um, uh, strategies to be shared with countries that are just considering these things that are just getting started to deal with issues around consent, around data sharing and so on, you know, privacy and so forth. So again, that was exactly the reason why that international consortium was started. And you know, these all are highly interactive consortium. A lot of the same people are involved in both. But I would urge you to, to look at their website. You know, they, they, I can tell you, they have meetings. And the most recent meeting, not surprisingly, was uh, had to be held virtually uh, because of the pandemic. But that means that I even think maybe they've even posted all the videos from that meeting. And, and I bet you the next meeting will likely be virtual. So it really provides a low barrier to entry, especially when some of these meetings are going to be broadcast um, through you know, platforms like Zoom. Uh, thanks. You, you mentioned uh, actually into the past of, of genomics, the oncology and pharmacology, and uh, rare diseases and uh, the pregnancy as area of uh, where actually in genomics is, uh, is there, but what about the, uh, I don't know, the prevention? What we should expect into the future uh, from uh, genomics and then the prevention? Yeah, no, that's a great, that's a great question. You know, as it's probably also a, a not a, 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 a di it's, it's a similar question we get asked about medicine in general. I think at least in the US, so we always talk about, we're very good at treating disease. We're not very good at preventing it. So I think genomics is just like everything, every other modality associated with healthcare that we only wish we were better at prevention. You know, certainly uh, one thing I didn't talk about and we talk about in the strategic vision is to keep your eye on is uh, because of, of, of the, the growth of studies looking at something called polygenic risk scores is growing very rapidly. So polygenic risk scores basically are, are scores that are calculated based on analyzing all of the genomic variants that a person has and developing correlations with individuals um, uh, for certain disease types and then developing a distribution. So while one variant might not say, hey, you're at high risk for, for sudden cardiac death, um, in combination, they're beginning to find combinations of variants involving very sophisticated mathematical models that stratify people as to being very high risk, high risk, medium risk, low risk, and so forth. And the hope is that if we can use those sorts of risk calculations um, to inform people, maybe that would start to put us down the road towards prevention. Um, you know, very similar to even single gene disorders where we know if you have a mutation in the BRCA1 gene, you probably wanna be more careful in monitoring yourself for breast cancer or for Lynch syndrome, for colon cancer and so forth. And so it's really early days and there's a lot of studies being done. And certainly these big cohort studies, be they all of us or the UK Biobank or any of these other ones are certainly jumping on that because they'll have the kind of scale that's gonna be needed. But I think people are very excited about the prospects of that. One of the problems with those studies though, and we're trying to address that 
is that there that you you have to be very careful when you analyze the scores for that have been generated from data from people, let's say, of Caucasian or ancestry. You, that doesn't work then when you're looking at somebody African American, for example, or some from other some other ancestry or some other part of the world. One of the problems we currently have in genomics is a lack of adequate diversity that represents all the world's populations. And that is a very high priority. We talk about it a lot in the strategic vision. We need to fix that so that all of these tools of genomics can be equally applied across all human populations so that everybody benefits. So I can speculate that one of the 10 uh, predictions for the future might be linked with uh, a new era for, for pre prevention, maybe a precision prevention or personalized prevention. And sometimes you hear, you hear lots of different words. A lot of times people talk about precision health as opposed to precision medicine or genomic health as opposed to genomic medicine. But I think it's very much health has to be a key part of it and prevention is a very important aspect of that. Actually, I think we will move from the population of prevention, the classical way to, to somehow to promote prevention to a more personalized way. And you, you mentioned epigenetic scores, but also you, you mentioned in the context of precision medicine initiative and all of us um, program the data, sensors and so on. Uh, should we expect, I don't know, in 10 years, for uh, some of us to have like a digital twin with a lot of genomic data, with the data coming from sensors, other types of data, what do you think? Uh, well, you know, I, I, I could envision that future. I don't know what that looks like, but I could absolutely envision that future. I, one of the things I would say is, you know, I, I could not have imagined, you know, 20 years ago or, you know, even 15 years ago, all the things that I can now do with my smartphone. Right, I mean, it's just unbelievable, and I barely am using it the way a lot of people are using it. And increasingly, there, you know, people are wearing sensors that are monitoring their blood pressure and monitoring blood analytes, monitoring their glucose levels, and so on and so forth. You know, ten years from now, uh, what will be the technologies, and could that there be enough data to know how to use that information to tailor your prevention strategies? Uh, you know, I wouldn't rule it out. Uh, obviously, we need a lot of research. And we probably need very large studies. That's one of the reasons why we need even studies in one country won't be big enough. We probably need to merge a lot of the data. And that's why we're trying to develop sort of the approaches to be able to merge data across countries to benefit everybody. We have uh, one more question. Personalized medicine will definitely help to get more precise treatment, more patients in uh, illness address. The question is from Corina Negra. It will be uh, way better from the human point of view, more healthy and the like people. But in the end, this will not be expensive for health system because there are so many diseases and so many different diseases uh, in the same disease. Probably it's about cancer. Yeah, it's something we, you know, it's a, it's a big debate is, you know, and, and will this save money in the long run? You know, if we, if people live longer, will that cost society more? And there's lots of debates that all cultures are going to have to face. Um, I think there's many examples, and I think, you know, we're learning this in cancer genomics where th there's just smarter ways of treating cancer that in the long run will save money. Or if you think about some of the simple tools of pharmacogenomics, we pay a lot for adverse drug responses. If we can avoid some of them, it will be less costly to health systems. But you know, these, these you can't prove these overnight, and you know, there's many issues that are going to have to be grappled with. But but it is a it is an issue um, that has to be studied and monitored. And we hope and we believe in the long run this would be more efficient and therefore cost savings. But but there certainly are some who don't believe that and have reservations about about some of the costs associated with the use of genomics. So we, we, we have to confront this and study it and hopefully find data to support our position. Because we have another question, All of, or most of us are looking for a solution for, for COVID-19 pandemics. And Claudia yeah. Dima asked, has genomics any application in COVID disease research? So it's a, it's a great question. And in fact, I'll tantalize you further to read our strategic vision. Because the, obviously the pandemic occurred at the very late stages of our strategic vision and it, our first draft of the paper, we didn't even talk about COVID. And we thought, you know what, we really need to talk about COVID. We actually added an epilogue at the very end of the paper that summarizes how genomics really is playing a role. You know, at first, 
why is genomics? I mean, it's, you know, we don't do infectious disease. Why we're doing human genomics? We mostly focus on the human genome. The fact is, you know, genomics is front and center in the response to COVID. If you look at the diagnostic methods, certainly a lot of them, a lot of the methodologies are using nucleic acid analyses and very inexpensive ways of analyzing uh, the, the viral nucleic acid that came out of genomics, absolutely. A lot of the vaccines are being developed with synthetic genomic approaches and some strategies that relied on genomics as part of that. And then I think where you're also going to see, you know, really, oh, and, and by the way, I don't, I, we're certainly doing this in the U.S. There's a lot of environmental monitoring of, of, of wastewater, of other, to, to monitor for the viral particles. Again, that's using metagenomic analysis of, of mixtures of materials like wastewater. But I think the other thing to really look for is clearly people respond differently to this virus. Why is some people hardly notice it and some people it's detrimental? Why is that? I think some of that variability is going to be encoded in our genomes and we've just got to tease this out. I can tell you that all of the big international cohorts are uh, aggressively trying to collect data about their participants on those who have gotten the infection and so forth and, and developing how, you know, a lot of data about how severely affected they are. There are many large human genomic studies going on to try to understand differential infectivity, the differential morbidity and mortality seen with the infection, so on and so forth. And so I think you will see genomics playing a role, even though this is an infectious disease. I have one more question regarding the, uh, the implementation of genomics in clinical routine, the adoption of the uh, uh, genomics by the uh, medical doctors. We have some, some examples on how to, or good practice, how to, to deal with, uh, with this, because we know that uh, the medical education is quite traditional and uh, it takes a lot of time to, you know, to implement new technologies. Yeah, so, you know, clearly we're hitting this at all levels in the U.S. We're certainly thinking about how to change, um, you know, try to infuse genomics into medical curriculum. Um, and we're even trying to start before then getting lots of younger kids even interested in genomics so that when they get to medical school, they're demanding it because they see this as something that's very relevant. You know, we, we, there's a lot of, of, of genomic education going on of practicing physicians. And, and, and you really have to do this in very specific and targeted ways. You know, if it's going to be prenatal testing, you're targeting the obstetricians. If it's the rare undiagnosed conditions, you're targeting pediatricians mostly. Um, obviously, I think oncologists get this. And so I think oncologists are very much adopting genomics. Um, what we're finding is we need, you know, referral services that could be as helpful as possible. Um, and in some cases, we need dedicated programs um, in undiagnosed diseases. I mean, in the U.S., we have a whole network of, of centers that focus on undiagnosed diseases and and patients get referred to them. It, it really has to be context specific. I think about neonatologists. I mean, you, you have that be local. So it's a big effort now to try to work with neonatologists to deal with their undiagnosed uh, acute cases of newborns uh, where they apparently have some very devastating disorder. They need genomic uh, intervention. You mentioned oncology and the benefits of, of genomics are, are clear. Tomorrow we have a special session on cancer genomics starting 6 p.m. on comprehensive genomic profiling. But I would like to, to ask you about uh, other potential areas that might benefit more and I have in mind, I don't know, cardiovascular diseases and the diabetes and the obesity, maybe you can provide us some insights. I think if you look at any of those areas, you know, hypertension, diabetes, autism, dementia, um, mental illness, I mean, all of those areas, they're mostly talking about these common diseases where the underlying genomic architecture is going to be complicated because there's going to be many genomic variants and there's going to be greater environmental influences. And so very large studies are going to be needed. Some of these will come out of these large cohort studies, but we really need to have complete accounting. You know, it has to be large numbers. You have to have comprehensive genomic information. A lot of times you want to have other information, environmental information, um, you know, lifestyle information, and so forth. I think we will see these things begin to be teased out. In all of those cases, that's the kind of thing polygenic risk scores seem to be a shortcut to get us there. Keep in mind, when you calculate a polygenic risk score, it does not tell you specifically what genes are involved. It just gives you a signature of a calculation based on analyzing tens of thousands of variants. And so again, that may be a shortcut to stratifying people, but it, we of course want to go further. We ultimately want to figure out the variants that are actually conferring risk. 
because those will give us insights about pathways. And it's when you get to pathways that you can start to think about you know, new drug design strategies, or you can think of other things to sort of combat the disease. So, you know, this is a marathon for common diseases. We know this, uh, where you see some successes, it gets very exciting. But we, what we do know is scale is critical. Uh, again, new organization just started, I, I, ICDA, International Common Disease Alliance. I would look at their website. There's a whole white paper, international groups of scientists coming together, recognizing that scale is going to be important and a lot of, of international efforts are going to be needed to really tackle the most common uh, disorders to really understand their genomic architecture. For the, uh, for the end of our discussion, I would like to, uh, to ask a question on uh, the perception of, of, of the genomics and maybe the education uh, on, on genomics of the general population. And uh, there are some people, uh, you know, might be scared, might have some ethical questions. Um, I don't know how to, based on your experience, how we should address this kind of uh, um, issues that will come uh, with, uh, once we'll discuss more about genomics in, in public space. Yeah, I think it's critically important. We talk a lot about this in the strategic vision. My institute's doing a number of things uh, to try to improve genomic literacy, to try to uh, address issues around distrust about, I mean, you know, genetics has, doesn't have a great history. So we can't completely shed our history of misuses of genetics. And we can't just say, well, we're genomics. So it doesn't, you know, of course it's us as well. And so we have to be very, very careful and mindful of people's concerns. We have to earn back their trust um, a, a, in a number of ways, and we need to have, you know, protections in place. Um, we need to think about data security. We need to think about laws and policies. In the United States, we have a law, something called the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, or GINA. It is a law that protects individuals from being discriminated against based on genetic information. So that helps, but still, we can, need to continually improve and build on that first pillar of trust to be able to engage a larger group of people. And we also need to recognize that we need to not just, we need to engage everybody. And if, by the way, it's one of the problems we're having that if our studies don't have diversity in them in terms of participants, that's not gonna go well when we then try to implement genomic medicine across all individuals when they say, oh, but your studies were hardly diverse. How do you know if it applies to me and my ancestral group? So there's so many things that are interwoven between how we do the science, how we earn the trust and how we implement genomic medicine. Genomics uh, become a part of, of the society is one of the key message you absolutely uh, uh, today. And, and, you know, and, and you know, and that just wasn't the, you know it wasn't there as as relevant even 20 years ago as, as it is now. And it's it, if we're going to see the realization of genomic medicine, we need to completely understand this. It's actually the reason, and I, I didn't really mention this, but I'll mention it now. It's the reason why you know we as an institute have always had what's called an ethical, legal, and social implications research program. If you ever see the four letters, E-L-S-I or ELSI, ethical, legal, social implications, it is because we've recognized that ELSI research, the societal implications of genomics, have to be advancing to keep in pace with the other advances if we're going to see the full realization of genomic, genomics in medicine and society. You also mentioned that uh, genomics is complex, but also the health system is complicated. Yes. And we have to deal with it. With this, uh, genomics is not everything, but it's right. a very important part of the uh, of the solution. And may I may say, I think we have uh, three very clear clear messages on what uh, is and should be the role of the uh, of the genomics in society and uh, in the health uh, system. Uh, for the end, I would like to uh, to to ask you a final message for for our, our audience. For the I don't know Romanian doctors, a lot of students join us today in Zoom. In uh, uh, Facebook, we have been live, and we are live on Facebook, on LinkedIn, and uh, and uh, YouTube. Great. What is your uh, your message for, especially for the uh, young? So people? What is my, okay, what, my 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 message is that you know the future of medicine will be benefited by genomic advances. But the realization of those genomic advances in medicine will require the collective efforts of researchers, healthcare professionals of various types, and society. We need everybody working in partnership. We can't just force this on people. 
Uh, we need to earn their trust. Um, and it's going to require that full continuum of activities from very basic science to translational science to clinical research to implementation. And, and, but that has to include partnerships with communities, um, with, with individual patients and their families in order to make uh, this uh, a reality. Professor Green, it was a great honor, pleasure, and a great source of inspiration for our future projects. Thank you so much for actually for opening the our activities, um, at the conference, the personalized medicine conference and uh, biotech, uh, European Biotech uh, Week. Thank you so much uh, once again. We'll continue tomorrow morning, 10 p.m. PM with the plenary session on how to build a resilient health system. And, and as I mentioned, tomorrow at 6 p.m. with the uh, special session on, on cancer genomics. And congratulations to you to organizing this exciting conference and best of luck going forward. Thank you so much. And thank you all the, uh, the attendees. And have a nice evening and day, <laughs> you Professor Green. Thanks.